Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020, featuring fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Nina Tandon, founder and CEO of EpiBone. This is very well attended. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawksbland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're joining us again for another edition of our virtual breakfast series. Um, you know, for those of you that have been joining us from the beginning, you know that um, we started this as an outgrowth of sort of the pandemic and being at home. Um, but what we never expected was when we were doing it in person, we were doing a breakfast for 25 to 30 people every other month. And we have just been so thrilled that we've been able to do this every week and to just to bring this amazing content um, to you sort of throughout the pandemic. And this is one of the pandemic things that is sticking. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, thank you to um, our partners at Goodwin Proctor, uh, the law firm for sponsoring this month's um, editions of our virtual breakfast series. Um, as always, please ask your questions either in the chat box or the Q&A. Derek and I will moder that, moderate that throughout the chat and um, push questions over to Nina. So without any further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to Derek to introduce our esteemed guest today. All right. Well, good morning, Nina. I can't thank you enough for being here. This is fantastic. Uh, you know, we probably first met each other over a decade ago because when we first met, I think you were actually still in Gordana's lab. This is even before uh, EpiBone and the whole bit because Beth was in Gordana's apartment, uh, not apartment, department, and we just moved to New York. <laughs> So it is, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, I, we've, we've watched with how you've built EpiBone. It's a great New York City story. And you know, truth be told, you've been a guest that we've wanted to have on for a while now. So it's yeah. great to have you here. Thank you. This is a so, real pleasure. So to dig in, uh, we tend to start with a little bit of how did you get here? And you've just got this terrific background from MIT and Columbia and McKinsey. So why don't you give everybody a little bit of a flavor mm -hmm. of how you got where you are and where EpiBone came from. Well, I, I, it's such a pleasure to be here um, in New York with New York Bio. I am a New Yorker born and bred. I live in the zip code where I grew up, um, which is Roosevelt Island. And, um, you know, I, I am from a bit of a geeky family, one of four kids. We used to do lots of family science experiments as ways to entertain ourselves. And um, so I think it was probably not much of a, um, you know, apple falling far from the tree to go to engineering school. And I, I stayed in the city for Cooper Union for undergrad, um, yeah. went there for electrical engineering. Um, that was that was a real trip, uh, about 10% women in there in that, and no female professors at the time. I later became the first female lecturer in electrical engineering, which was a real joy and, um, and worked in telecom after I graduated. So it was 2001, my second day of work was September 11th. It was a crazy time. Okay. And, and I think in part due to some of those philosophical, um, you know, angst that was everyone was feeling during the time with the markets and, um, and, and the state of the world, I found myself taking night classes in anatomy and physiology <laughs> at the local community college and um, decided that I wanted to make a jump into um, the biological side of electrical engineering. Um, you know, DNA was like a hard drive. Um, you know, neurons could be modeled by the cable equations. This was something I wanted to dig into. And MIT had a program in bioelectrical engineering. And I thought that's where I want to go. It was um, pretty much the only place I applied and, um, and found myself there. And um, I was an electrical engineer, um, not really understanding all those equations around transport and things like that. And I ended up making friends with one of my recitation instructors who uh, was named Gordana Vunyak Novakovich and worked in the Langer lab at MIT. I knew none of this except that she was my favorite professor. And um, so I ended up working with her in the Langer lab at MIT. And she moved to Columbia and I moved with her. And that's how, uh, so I've been working with Gordana um, since 2004. 2003, maybe. So we're going, we're getting, we're closer to 20 than 10 years. That's for sure. Yep. And, um, and she supported me after my, my, I did my PhD in the intersection of electrical engineering and tissue engineering. So using electrical signals to grow cardiac tissue specifically. And mm -hmm. when I 
finished my PhD, I, I really wanted to get a sense of the wider world of healthcare and ended up, and she supported me. She said, you're going to the dark side, you'll probably be back. Um, and, uh, and she was right on both counts. One thing you learn about Kavana <laughs> is she's right about everything important. Um, and uh, so I ended up working as a pharma med device consultant at McKinsey, but two years later, she was right. Um, she invited me back to the lab to help work on the business plan that became EpiBone and, and supported me in an executive MBA program as well. So I ended up getting an MBA in parallel with my postdoc at Columbia, and it was a great launching pad for what ultimately became EpiBone. Uh, EpiBone is a tissue engineering company, by the way, where we mm -hmm. use patient stem cells and digital fabrication to grow uh, living skeletal replacements, bone and cartilage mostly. Okay, well, I'm actually going to post your TED talk in the uh, in the <laughs> okay, chat here. Okay, embarrassing. Which, uh, well, it's, that's not, no, it's not embarrassing. It's actually it's it's it a good. great talk, and it gives yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Um, and you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about your experience with uh, with TED, but also I wanted to give a quick you know shout out for Gordana here because in addition to Epibone, you know, she's launched both you know Xilix and Tara Biosystems uh, out of her lab. She's just she's just exceptional in every single way and is you know one of kind of the pillars of the entrepreneurial academic community here so you know yeah. it's you always have you know when you see these labs that are actually really good at spitting out companies and professors that are that good at supporting the people that are in their lab after they leave their lab uh, and the whole bit you know we just we we want to make sure that they're recognized for kind of doing a great job there oh. so Gordana is in a class on her own. I mean, she's, she's a awesome. prolific inventor in her own right and entrepreneur. And um, and she's just also, you know, this doesn't have to go together, but she's a wonderful human being. You know, she's my it's mom. It's nice when it does. It's nice <laughs> when it does. Like my mom and her and she say, oh, we're both like Nina's mom, you know, and, um, and I love that. It's a family. She There's a joke. You never leave Gordana's orbit once you've gotten into it, you know. <laughs> the escape velocity is still too much. <laughs> the, the best ones are always like that. So we we'll, we don't have to spend too much time on the uh, on the TED stuff. But you know, really, did you find it useful? What kind of things did you take away from that process that were helpful, either you know, from a t either from a storytelling perspective or just stuff that you know you found kind of helpful on the entrepreneurial journey? Well, you know. It was so the TED Talk is ten years old now. I'm thinking that yes. it's uh, a good time for an anniversary update. Um, so it's a good time to reflect on what it's really meant in my career. And I, I was a TED Fellow, um, so it was um, you know during my postdoc they 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 had this program to kind of bring people who were more at the early stage of their careers into the TED community. Um, there was a sense that the TED community had a lot to offer um, to to younger folks, and um, and I was just so ecstatic. I was one, you know, it was I used to watch those talks all the time, and I still do, and um, and I applied, and it was a wonderful experience. I had a chance as a fellow, and then later as a senior fellow, to go to three years of conferences, and each conference is about two weeks long for the fellows, so. Mm -hmm. Um, really developing a sense of community with our cohort and our class, many of whom have become, you know, EpiBone advisors, investors, and, and certainly people that we've kind of lifted each other up over the years. And the TED conference um, was a great place to launch these ideas around tissue engineering for myself. And, um, and then folks at the, the conference itself also became um, important supporters of the of the company. We essentially raised a, a large portion of our first round of funding um, just during that conference. Um, and they're wonderful people, generally. So it's it's this nice um, kind of virtuous cycle of you know meeting good people. Good people lead you to more good people, and um, and it really has has had served as a wonderful launching launching pad for the company and um, and for myself as well. I. It was, um, you asked about storytelling. I think I've never really, you know, you go, you see enough conference talks like, you know, academic talk, conference talks, and then you see talks that are given at TED and um, you can start to borrow from the best of both worlds. Um, you know, at TED, yeah. the fewer words on a slide, the better. Um, in academia, we, I think, have the opposite view. Uh, so <laughs> it's, um, it, was, it was such a good learning experience and I'm constantly drawing from it even now. So to go back to go back to where 
kind of EpiBone was founded? You know, when did you kind of first know that you had a company or, or that you wanted to do a company? And what was the initial kind of fundraising like around it? I realize it all kind of blends into the TED experience and everything, but, sure. you know, what was that like kind of trying to put the initial pieces of it together? Well, um, I, you asked me about, you know, when did I know I wanted to start a company? I think I was, you know, 12 years old doing the babysitter's club. <laughs> you know? So I, I always had a bit of an entrepreneurial bug. My mom had um, used to do biz dev for us whenever she'd see someone pushing a stroller. I have three teenage daughters. Um, but, you know, all kidding aside, I, I think I really knew that I wanted to not be fully in academia around, I was around the time coming towards the end of my PhD, which was um, about 08, 09. And, um, you know, the stem cell wars were all the rage and, um, and I, I had a real strong sense that the wider world of healthcare had a lot going on that I wanted to be a part of. Um, it was around the same time that the patent cliff started to be discussed as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when I ended up going to McKinsey, it was a great introduction at the 30,000 foot view to the world of healthcare. You know, everyone jokes that within your first week, you have a meeting where this, a CEO of a large publicly traded company is going to be there. And that was very much my yeah. experience. Um, and, and seeing the the kind of vulnerability of some of these high power people, you know, in the process of getting advice from um, consultants like at McKinsey, um, I got a sense for the human side of what it's like to run a company, um, how asking good questions is oftentimes better than having good answers, uh, which is mm -hmm. really, I mean, it was, coming from academia where you're expected to always have yeah. answers to questions, that was a really important reframe for me. And, um, you know, and, and, and so this convergence of forces with the patent cliff, um, academia kind of rising up to, to kind of uh, serve as a hotbed of innovation and, um, and seeing from this 30,000 foot view how all these large companies were buying smaller companies in order to kind of bolster their pipelines made me realize that I wanted to be at that intersection myself. And of course, Gordana was someone I was always noodling on this with. Um, and as a good mentor, she helped me find my way. So I knew I wanted to come to academia, be part of spinning technologies out of the lab. I, I'd been an inventor on a few pieces of IP. Um, and, and so that was really an exciting intersection for me. And uh, so I think that was, it was not really an aha moment, but it was um, more like a slow boil aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and even after coming back to uh, be a postdoc in the lab, it was, we incubated the company another couple of years. Um, as well, it's 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 such a timing issue when you think about technologies. When's the right time for them to be in the academic setting? When is it, it a good time for them to spin out? Um, and so I, I would say it was just really seeing all those forces come together. I knew I wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. So since this is going to set up a little bit more of what we're going to talk about uh, in the next you know little bit, can you give just a minute or two on? what EpiBone's core technology is and, and what the company does? So EpiBone marries two technologies, a digital fabrication, technologies like 3D printing, 3D micromilling, um, and stem cell engineering. Um, so what we do is we take stem cells and we um, infuse them onto anatomically precise scaffolds, that which we can machine using 3D printing and 3D milling. And um, we a lot of our core IP is around what we call bioreactors. So these are technologies that are advanced cell culture systems that can, that essentially give cells a, a very complex controlled environment in order to coax them into doing things. In our case, we coax the cells into becoming bone and cartilage. It takes us three weeks to grow bone. It takes us four weeks to grow cartilage. We're also growing combinations of bone and cartilage for um, what we hope will be partial knee replacements down the line. So it's um, it's a really exciting time. Our, our bone product is now going into clinic. So we've transitioned from preclinical into clinical, which is a very exciting transition for us. Well, you took my thunder away a little bit there because I was literally oh. going to tell you when I saw the, no, no, when I saw, because since I've known about this company for you know, eight or nine years now, I, when I saw the announcement that you guys got the okay to go into clinicals, I literally did the, sit at the computer and like cheer. <laughs> it was just, well, it's such a huge moment for any company to transition from, you know, from being, you know, being preclinical to being clinical because it's, it's very real. And, 
you know, it's now actually going into a human. It's now no longer a slide. It's no longer, uh, it's no longer in a mouse. It's no longer anything else. It's now we are confident enough to put this into patients. And, you know, it, it, so what I wanted to ask you about is when you first started fundraising, you know, do you see now a bit of a difference in people being able to quote unquote get the story, right? Is it easier for people to grasp where you're going with the company now that, you know, it's not this technology that could replace bone because the business model for that wasn't necessarily easily graspable, right? Now that it's actually going into patients, do you find that people get it much more quickly? I do, you know, there's a lot of shorthand, um, you know, because the FDA is so difficult to get through, um, making that transition shows that you have enough operational know-how in addition to the scientific know-how to get that approval. And that is not trivial. A there's a huge attrition of companies that never get to that stage. So I think, um, you know, it, A, the technology is becoming more real, like you suggested, mm -hmm. because it's going into people. Um, but from a business standpoint, I find that people also find it to be a huge de-risking. You know, that, yeah. that the team has done this, therefore the team is, you know, knows what they're talking about uh, to a certain degree, <laughs> because clearly there's so many steps ahead. Um, but having gotten to this juncture has been um, really good for folks to say, okay, we're getting approved by IRBs at the top tier medical institutions across the country. All of that carries some weight um, because they're yeah. difficult challenges. Yeah. Yeah people are much more willing to, you know, give you $20 million if you lay out what your clinical trial is going to look like than if they would give you $2 million when you say, well, we'll be in the clinic in five years. So Preaching it's- the it's, choir. I hope, by I the know. way, we are raising uh, very soon uh, uh, an amount of money very close to that. We're, we're aiming Good. to raise um, 25 million uh, in our next round. And, and we've raised 25 million to date and that took six years. So to do the same, to turn around and do the same in the next, um, you know, 12 months is something that is a big challenge for us. But clinical is a big transition. So we're transitioning on the business side as well as the clinical side. Well, you've shown that well, you we, put that, that 25 million to good use, you have results and therefore, yeah, you're looking for the next step. Yeah. Also, we have 42 minutes left in this webinar. I mean, people can mail checks to New York Bio. We'll just pass them <laughs> along to you. That's what we haven't we haven't ever closed a funding round before the end of a webinar, but there's always a first time. <laughs> I won't say no. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> it's not clear to me legally that that would work, but we would try and make it work. Yeah, we are a connector. So what are? Yeah, exactly. So. What are you? So, what does your clinical path look like? What are the first indications that you're that you're that you're putting the technology into? And you know, when do you expect the readouts to be? So, there's interesting historical perspective on this because our field used to be regulated as tissue products. So, you know, you would go. We would be regulated similar to you know um, a bone graft you might get from a cadaver or something like that, um, or some in some cases a device. <clears throat> it is a three-dimensional therapy after all. However, because cells are the active ingredient, the FDA does regulate us currently as a biologic. And, um, and so that has been really interesting, um, probably a topic for another day. So we're regulated as a biologic. That means we, um, however, um, like many biologics, you can combine safety and efficacy for that first round of trials. So we have a combined phase one, two. Mm -hmm. And we're implanting uh, engineered jaw bones into six patients. So, um, you know, this part of the, the face right here, you know, for folks who have, whether it's for cancer trauma or congenital defects, needing their jaw to be, um, parts of it to be replaced, we'll be doing that. We're following them for a year. And, um, you know, in the meantime, we're also, you know, bringing our two pipeline products to the same stage that we are now with our bone. So it's, it's a very, we are an 18 person team. So we are very efficient with how we use, how we use, um, deploy everyone on the team. So um, we have folks that are working on the clinical manufacturing as well as uh, manufacturing for our animal studies for the two pipeline products. We find that having three products is a good balance between laser focus and proving out the platform. Yep. Where yeah, do you it's actually, your... sorry, Jennifer. Go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, I was gonna say, where do you do your manufacturing? In Brooklyn, we have an artisanal <laughs> GMP certified, you know, cell, little cell manufacturing uh, 
factory. It's uh, about 700 square feet. Um, and we use modular clean room components that we bought from a company uh, here in New York State. So we're very proud that we were able, we were able to build that ourselves. I, I think our engineering know-how, my co-founder and I, I should mention my co-founder, Sarind Fumaritana, he and I did our PhDs with Cordana. So we've also been working together in some way, shape or form for 16-ish years. Um, so because we both were, you know, our engineering nerds, we didn't really shy away from the ISO 5, ISO 8 standards and really got down the rabbit hole in terms of designing this room. And, and we built it all in for slightly under a million dollars. So we were really proud of that. Um, clinical manufacturing to um, contract that out would have been a large portion of that just on a month to month basis. And we wanted to retain the flexibility to um, not only continue to develop IP in house and retain that knowledge, um, but to be able to, to use the system for more than one product over time. Mm -hmm. right. And then talk to us about your plans to scale, assuming positive right, trial results. Mm -hmm. Well, we are, um, we're still figuring this out. Um, this is uh, the, the make or contract question is a big one in, in cell, ther cell therapies, as you yeah. know. And yep. um, so part of the reason why we decided to use these modular clean room components was that we knew that if we wanted to scale up at least partially during yeah. clinical trials, that we'd be able to do that in-house. You know, you can add on one or two or three modules, or you can just kind of cut and paste and plant yeah. another one down. Um, but for scalability on the order of what it's going to, what we really think this is going to require, because these are blockbuster markets. There are right. 7 million Americans living with a joint replaced because of just a couple millimeters of damaged cartilage. There are, there is a real need for scale up. Um, we are figuring out, this is a bit of a moving target with the field. Um, a lot of investments are coming from a lot of different directions in biomanufacturing. So we haven't kind of made a decision on that yet. Um, but what we're counting on is that um, if we do want to build things in house, we do feel comfortable with doing that. We are absolutely yeah. though speaking with uh, the Lanzas of the world uh, to, you know, around um, whether it makes sense to do something in the future there. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, if you get big enough, everyone ends up talking to Lonza. Um, and it's funny, just it's like from a all future, roads lead to Lonza. <laughs> they do. <laughs> Anyone they do. from Lonza on the call? And, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> from a future perspective, you know, there's there's all of the there, there's all of the hype around you know longevity, living forever, et cetera. And I think what people realize what people don't necessarily realize is you know, the stuff that wears out is, you know, the cart, you know, your cartilage and stuff wears out. Like it's, it's the, it's the friction bearing parts of the car that, uh, that tend to break. So I think you guys are in an incredible position. So in terms of how you built a company, I'm interested in talking about team building because, you know, you have now an 18 person team, which is, which is big by startup standards because you started with two, right. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about the about what I would call the phases, right? If you start with two, you know, what was your next block of people and how did that change things? And, you know, what was kind of the block of people that got you to 18? Well, uh, that's a great question. And I just want to give a shout out. Um, there are a couple of friends on this call, um, but one of them is uh, Lori Dernovich, who's an active participant in this series. And uh, she's really helped us on day one with building our team. Uh, for those of you who don't know who she is, she is a, a leadership coach who specializes in the life sciences. And she loves the archetype of the type of entrepreneurs that we are, which is science nerds learning how to build teams. <laughs> and um, in the Olympic games of doing a startup, she is like an elite level coach. And, um, and so we started with three. My, my co-founder and I hired um, a, another postdoc from, from mm -hmm. Columbia BME. Um, the three of us were an initial block, and then we we hired kind of one person at a time. And uh, we had always been told hire slow, fire fast. Um, we've hired slow. We've not really fired anyone. Um, so I think we've done a good job at really managing a low level of attrition. Um, we have had people that have moved on to grad school and things like that, but it's been very much uh, an organic growth. And um, and working with Lori on day one, we had a chance to really be thoughtful about. Um, the, the tone we want to set for the company, one of our company values is grow, not build. That works for cells. It also works for teams. Um, and, you know, working with a leadership coach at, at the very beginning in either the individual setting or the group setting has been very helpful for us to, um, 
avoid problems before they become problems, uh, really treating coaching as if it's not remedial and helping us to grow in to the roles that are expected of us at each step. So I, I couldn't even tell you what I was working on six years ago with her, but she's been with us all the way. And, um, and my, my, my co-founder and I do what we call couples therapy with her. Um, so every month we sit down and we, we hash things out. And, and so as a result of this, I think we have very productive conflict resolution because we're working on issues before they even become the kind that raise your blood pressure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and, and learning so much in an individual manner because it's, it's sort of like when you're a grad student, you, um, you really work with, if you're a PhD student, you work with postdocs, your postdocs work with other postdocs, you know, this mentorship and peer mentorship is something that um, we've borrowed from the academic context and I think works quite well for us. So we're, we're very proud to have her with us. She hasn't fired us as a client yet. Um, and I, I saw her here, so I wanted to give her a shout out. <laughs> oh, she's, she's great. She's one of my favorite people. And, you know, I think one of the things that uh, you mentioned that's interesting is that she works with the entire team. Mm -hmm. I think the, I, I think probably the prevailing, you know, stereotype is a leadership coach works with one person. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, not necessarily true. No. And, yeah. you know, I think, you know, because there's many more people on the team than just one person. So I like the, I like the fact that you've taken kind of the group approach to, uh, to building here and that everyone kind of has something to learn within the team. Yeah, it's, I can't, I, I, you know, not to belabor this, but one of the benefits of having her work individually with each person on the team, and then sometimes in the group setting or in pairs, is that um, issues emerge, you know, even though this is all a confidential process, um, what I would sometimes learn on our monthly kind of recaps is I'm, you know, Lori will say, oh, I'm hearing that there's some patterns around burnout that are, bur that are coming up. You might want to think about addressing that or, um, mm -hmm. you know, flagging issues to me that would be below the radar if, if yeah. we didn't have this help. So, um, I think yep. it's made me a more responsive, um, member of my team. And, um, and I think it contributes to our really low attrition on the team as well. And I, yeah. I actually, Lori obviously works with a lot of New York bio member companies, particularly early stage companies. And I really think that that type of work, Lori in particular, has had an impact on how our early stage companies are growing in our ecosystem, um, which is pretty amazing to see if, if you're taking a thoughtful approach to team building. Um, yeah. Speaking of team building, you've grown organically. Have you had trouble? Um, this is a softball. Have you had trouble hiring in New York <laughs> or are New, do you find... Um, New York is a good place to hire uh, team members. <laughs> yeah, we've had, you know, we've had really good luck in New York. Um, I would say, especially just given our networks in academia and, and New York has no shortage of top tier institutions um, where we ended up actually for the first time using a headhunter um, was when we were looking to hire folks in realms that we weren't as well connected in like quality. Yeah. Um, and uh, we ended up importing some folks from Jersey, but uh, <laughs> they're all welcome to New York, right? We'll take welcome. it. We'll take it. Yeah. So we have some folks on the team who um, commute to Brooklyn from New Jersey, um, but certainly within the tri-state area, there is no shortage of talent. Um, it's been it's been a real joy. Yeah. But but just I think understandably coming out of academia, we had less of a network to um, some of the work streams that are much more industry focused, like yeah. quality. How have, uh, how have you and the team handled COVID? I mean, if you think about it, this, you've been at a huge transition point here and then, and then COVID dropped right into the middle of things. So how has that impacted the way that, uh, that things have flown within inside the team and, and where the company is going to go? Well, it was like for many folks on this call, I'm sure it was, it was a bit of a, a shock to us that we, um, you know, needed to absorb and, and figure out how to respond to um, very, we have a really great chief of staff at the company. He's one of these wizards that everyone hopes to be lucky enough to work with. And his name is Blake. He, um, on the first, within the first few hours of the PPP loan being um, announced, he'd already applied. So we'd already got, we got essential business status, got a PPP loan. And, um, and so immediately we kind of created a little bit of flexibility for ourselves flexibility in terms of how are we going to operationally handle this yeah. situation um, and also uh, flexibility in terms of being able to tell the team, we don't know exactly how we're going to deploy everyone, but your jobs are safe. 
And, and I think that was yep. really important to just get out of the way at the beginning. And then we, we did, you know, we, we were affected. The two main ways we were affected were um, we just been greenlit for a clinical trial and elective surgeries were all put on hold, moratoriums across the country. Um, although there was some spotty, there were differences in how different hospitals were handling that. IRBs also tended to be deprioritized if they weren't COVID related. So we, we chose to, um, you know, even though it was only a six patient trial, we chose to onboard five clinical trial sites because we wanted to geographically disperse that risk. That turned out to be a really um, valuable exercise um, because it's just been a roller coaster to, to witness how different places like Ohio, Texas, California, New York are handling the right. situation. Yep. Um, we also did a risk analysis on all of our all of our activities and and took bets actually. So everyone was so afraid to say, I don't what they thought because yeah. we were just so lost. So I said, okay, we're gonna do a game. Um, what is your probability that you assign to our IRB getting approved in March, August, September, December, next yeah. March, and and kind of pulled the regulatory experts, the people on the team, and so on and um, and then made decisions based on those probabilities. Say, well, you know, we're gonna have to take some bets and yeah. we took some bets. And I'm really glad that, um, you know, at, we, had, we had a thought that our clinical trial would be where we are right now, more by September of last year. So we were a little bit off, um, mm -hmm. but we are now approved at several sites. And, and, you know, we had all said that by March, we all thought that 100% probability, we would have one patient enrolled. And, um, and so I think, that bet is, is turning out to be true. It was, it was an exercise in trying to operate in the unknown. Yeah. And, um, and then of course, keeping the team safe, setting occupancy limits in the lab. Um, that really meant that I wasn't allowed in the lab. I'm like the least important person in the lab <laughs> um, at this point with my PowerPoint skills, just being appropriate. <laughs> appropriate. So um, the business team really just went remote and, and you know, like many companies, um, especially companies like ours, where I think in life sciences companies, we're so used to physical co-presence yes. that yeah. the, um, you know, cause lab work is so real and um, physical. And um, so transitioning into a remote environment, I think was, um, you know, had a couple hiccups, but wasn't crazy. Um, and I think that that will stick with us. We had a very much a culture of, you know, not being remote. Um, but now we are, we have been fully functional for a year now with never being in the same physical room together now for a year. So yep. yeah, it's, it's been a, a growing process that I know a lot of others have gone through as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. It is kind of terrifying to think we're coming up on a year with this. Oh yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's a pretty, it's a pretty crazy thing. So you're now, you mentioned before, you're in the middle of, of raising around and, you know, how is the, how is the transition to Zoom based, Zoom based financing? It's interesting. Um, so, you know, and we're just at the beginning of it now. In some ways, it's been quite heartening, the fact that people are, are willing to make themselves accessible and the kind of informality that comes from meeting folks yeah. while they're in their living rooes, I think yep. has been a surprising um, boost to some of the networking activities, you know, that we've been doing to meet people. Good people always introduce you to good people. So um, we find that we're spending a lot less time in, in cars going from place to place and can actually um, have those conversations with, um, I hate to say efficiency because it's like icky, but, um, but getting a chance to have um, really high quality meetings with good people, um, more of them. Um, however, it has been a challenge because a lot of decisions are made by committee and um, getting a chance to really you know, and our, our, our lab is a huge, you know, for us, it's like our crown jewel. We love to show off our clean room. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I'd say for us transitioning into the virtual environment, we've, um, we've now find ourselves relying on video a lot more. We made, um, we, we produced a short video lab tour where we interview all of our key scientists and show them around the lab, show them, show them our quality control room, show them, you know, the bioreactors and really, mm -hmm and investing in product videos that explain the mechanics of how cells attach to the scaffold and create the graft. So, um, you know, it, the jury's out, it remains to be seen um, how well this all pays off. But, you know, we kicked off a, a round of funding um, 
a bridge round just you know to, we had some folks who'd been interested in the last round and we um you know just we know that it's always better to have more money in the bank when you're negotiating um on your next round of funding so um but you know even just in the first couple of weeks of launching that it's a five million bridge you know we've already got you know more than a million committed and so i think it is there is momentum i think you just have to be really thoughtful about you know how to create digital assets that can help supplement the the virtual environment and i i hope it pays off we've got good people in the works and and it's good to have opportunities like this just to to kind of feel like you're connected i mean i used to love going to the physical conference and sitting on panels and chatting with people some of those activities are kind of being recreated in in um in venues like this so thank you yeah, well, it's interesting to think about it's, you know, you kind of have to take a holistic view, you know, how do people connect and what do you get out of those interactions and, you know, what are those interactions like and where is where is the value we've we've had to think about this as an organization, this has been uh, a great forum, I think, because we get into we get into more of kind of the why and the personal behind what people do. And, you know, that I think that gives just a little more flavor to what everybody's thinking about and why they did it. And it gives you kind of a different, it gives you a different picture of the person when they're in a format like this, rather than being on a panel, right? You, yeah. you ask different questions in, a, in this kind of format than on a panel. So if you were to think about kind of everything you've done with the company up until now, you know, and you could kind of go back, you know, a decade, what would you, what would you say to yourself 10 years ago? Uh, in terms of how you're going to handle things, not necessarily what you would do different, but what kind of what kind of things would you want to talk about with yourself ten years ago? Mm. Well, that is not a softball question at all. No, um, no that's not a, <laughs> no. <laughs> I just, I just remember, you know, I have a softball question. Yeah, I mean, it's now that it, it's been there's been a chunk of time that I've been, I've been working on this in, in a few different iterations. And um, I definitely am not a person, I don't like to think of myself as an arrogant person, um, but it has been a joy for me to witness a kind of um, slow burn <laughs> of confidence building over the years. Um, you know, we, I have, we have been through some really tough times. I mean, there's ups and downs and they say with startups, the highs are highs and the lows are low and, and last longer. Um, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think what I would tell my younger self is you will, you will go, you will, you will need friends to talk you off the ledge at times. There will be times where you don't know a way out. And, um, and yet you will, you are a survivor you will figure this out and you will learn as you go. You're perfect the way you are and you're growing. I think that's what I would say, you know, is because I, I wish that I could go back and, and sort of like the matrix, like download, you know, I know Kung yeah, Fu. Yep. Like I, I would love that. Um, <laughs> and, and, yet, and yet somehow that seedling of a, of a person uh, did become who I am. And I also, I'm at, a, at kind of the midpoint in my career now, I'm in my early forties where I can look ahead and say, do I have maybe 20 more years where I want, you know, of, of a certain pace or how many years do I want of this pace before, you know, I feel like I'm in this, in this really nice stretch of time where I'm at that sweet spot of having had 20 years experience, but also yeah. have 20 plus years ahead to, yeah do something with that and and it's a really yep. nice time in the in in one's career you know I, I I've been working on you know there's a marathon every day of you know getting through the day and yep. then there's an increment of that that gets saved for future use and um those add up so if you show up every day work really hard for 20 years there will be something that comes from that and I think in my case, it's, it's, you know, a some level of maturity, I'm not going to like, you know, act like <laughs> I've got things figured out. Um, but I would say I have um, a level, a, a, a better sense of level headedness when things like COVID say came our way, I said, you know, yeah. we have been through times where, you know, the FDA sent us a letter and oh, by the way, we have, you know, a certain 
X amount of runway, what are we going yeah. to do? You know, and right. um, and I, I always tell myself, well, we got through that, so we can get through this. And I think, yep. you know, the school of hard knocks, if um, you know, it is a good education, and and um, and I think I've been. I definitely have discovered my own survivor mindset and, and the, the creativity that comes from real challenge, like real challenge, like the existential mm -hmm. yes. kind of challenge, <laughs> um, you know, like, and, um, and then also a huge amount of gratitude to the people who have been above me, below me, beside me. Um, and this community is just so rich, full of folks. I mean, I'm seeing some of your attendees, the participants, um, several of them are, are on the call. It's, it's such a vibrant community. And, um, and I've kind of grown up along with the New York bio, uh, a, a, you know, the past 10 years have been huge for our scene, you know, our mm -hmm. city. So it's been a real joy to kind of grow up with that at the same time. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. I just rambled a little bit. I, um, my younger self, I think would be I don't, I hope she wouldn't be just too disappointed in where we've landed. I hope she'd be proud. <laughs> I, I would, I would, I would find it hard for anybody to be disappointed with, uh, with, with where you are and, and the journey you've been on. You know, my, my wife has a nice saying and a lot of things she says, you know, the only way out is through and oh, you had a, yep. You had a, you had a great phrase before with kind of the slow boil to the aha. And when you think about it, the, the slow boil you've got, you know, all these small data points that go up into the right and all yeah. of the, uh, all of the learning that comes along with it. And it's really kind of a great encapsulation of kind of building confidence by going through each of these kind of little trials along the way. So, you know, it's one of the reasons that you guys are, are a terrific story. So to follow that up with probably a, a less challenging question, we had a, a hard hitting question from the audience about, you know, what are the cords and the wires to the right of you and what are we looking at behind you oh that's thank you for asking. Less extent, that's okay. no problem everyone um, wants to know <laughs> yeah i don't who wants to know anyway, um everyone <laughs> yeah so i resisted the urge to uh put one of those virtual backgrounds behind me um i'm in my husband's music studio um so let's just see this <laughs> is <laughs> This is a giant modular synthesizer. Um, for those of you who know what modulars are, and these are some keyboards, the DJ booth, and some records. So I, when I need a really quiet space, I ask him to work in his office, and and he's kindly given it to me. Um, it's a lot of fun. This is this is the fun room of the house, and 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 it's fun because I'm an electrical engineer by training, and. So I understand how a lot of these um, little gadgets and circuits work from a theoretical standpoint, and I can also solder. I'm a you know mean with a solder iron, um, so sometimes we get a chance to play together and and fix some of the machines, which is fun. Yep. Thanks for asking. You know, my, <laughs> I know it's a little strange. Um, <laughs> we went with it. Both of both of my kids learned how to use a soldering iron before they were four, so we're oh uh, yes, we're very well much done. in a similar boat. Yeah. Done. No, that's my that's my wife more than me, but they both are proficient with with a number of uh, of different tools. She's so cool. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, she's she's got it. Um, so hold on one second here. So I wanted to ask you also because your website says that you guys have had artists in residence, right? And I thought this was actually a good segue into that. So I don't think that's typical for a startup biotech company. So how did you how did you think of that and have, you know, what does that process look like? Have they, have they impacted the way that your company is, has grown and the way that your team interacts with each other? Um, well, I will say I was inspired by Gordana. She had an artist in residence in her lab um, years ago. And, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a student from Cooper Union. Um, so that the Cooper Union is well known for engineering, art and architecture. And mm -hmm. so I've always had um, close friends who are in the artistic community. And it's, you know, there's an art to science and there's the art and science of running a business and, and the body is a work of art. And, and so um, it's something that I've, I'd always wanted to do. I'll, I'll be honest, it's something that's gone on hiatus, uh, especially now with COVID. Um, but when we, we've had a couple of artists that have uh, resided with us, so to speak, one of mm -hmm. them um, used our methods of growing bone to grow um, bone-based jewelry. Um, Ooh, cool. Yeah, 
Um, actually, two of them did that. Um, and there was an exhibit at the Museum of Design in Atlanta, which was really cool that incorporated some of their work. Um, we also had a visual artist working with us who um, worked with pen and paper. So she would, she, she would spend countless hours drawing images that looked like what you would see under the microscope and, and also teaching um, drawing workshops with this with the with the staff with the with the team. And um, it was a real joy. I mean, we have folks, you know, well, I don't know, I mean this is being recorded, but I don't think he'd mind if I said this. Um, but Henry Kravis, who's one of the uh, the founders of KKR and is a, a real supporter of Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, was an entrepreneur in residence and um, was an entrepreneur in residence when I was a student um, in incubating Epibone and he was an advisor to us and then ended up investing um, and supporting us. Um, but he's also a real patron of the arts. And, um, and so one, the, the picture that Eliza had made was something that I had the chance to give to him as a gift. Um, and it was, you know, we've also worked with um, one of my best friends, uh, she, I don't think she's listed on the website, but um, she's a, a designer that has actually made my wedding ring, my engagement ring, and um, has made jewelry that's biologically based. And um, we made um, earrings and cufflinks for our investors one year. And, um, oh, you know, because cool. bone is so beautiful, the bone, the lattice of yeah. scaffolds that make bone, it's so porous and beautiful, or the, the fibers that are, you know, in cardiac tissue are, are just gorgeous and um and so it's given us a chance to just kind of play with that and have fun so i'm, I'm hoping to be able to continue our, our artist residency in the future um you know as 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 covid goes more in our rearview mirror yeah. yeah you know just the fact that you did it in the first place i think it's something that most companies kind of never take you know never take enough time to kind of think about the way that the outside world impacts what they're doing that you know sometimes there's a benefit to myopic focus and sometimes there's some drawbacks and agreed you know i think in a lot of ways when you know a lot of ways there is it's a cultural decision as much as anything else you know how do you want your your employees and how do you want your team to interact and how do you want your team to look at the world so it's actually it's a really it's a really interesting thing and uh it's great that it sounds like you took a lot out of it so right before we started you uh you had mentioned you thinking about uh homebrew Oh, about, yeah. We could talk a little bit about hobbies and stuff like <laughs> hobbies. that. Hobbies. Um, yes. Well, I, I like to play in the music studio um, with the family. The toddler loves the drum machine. Oh, um, yeah, that's great. Um, the, the newborn, <laughs> we'll see where he gravitates. Um, but during when I was pregnant um, with my firstborn, and I don't know if it was because I wasn't drinking um, or because I was kind of stuck at home more, um, but I really got into brewing beer and actually there were several teams I am one of, I am like the fourth or fifth person on our 18 person team to get into homebrew okay so the guys they were always there was always chat about homebrew um going on at the lab and I was like how hard is this you know let me, let me see. <laughs> and uh, I gotta tell you fermenters and sterilizing all the equipment for brewing beer is so much easier than mammalian cell culture so <laughs> For all you guys on this call, it is it is a low hanging fruit in terms of hobbies that pay off. So um, at a certain point at my heyday, um, a few months back, I had three fermenters going on at all times because um, it takes three weeks to ferment and then you do the secondary fermentation, which is another three weeks, and then you age the beer. So you can sort of cycle things through. And and I had my lab notebook where I was like writing down all the recipes and Oh, it was so much fun because it, it really pays off, um, you know, being able to like go to July 4th with like yeah. a bunch of, you know, beer that, you know, you could, and it made me a better, I think the thing that I mostly got out of it um, was that it made me a better beer drinker, which is a, an aspiration I think many of us should have. Um, there is so much going on <laughs> in beer right now. It's mm -hmm. like, it's yeah. great. And a lot of women are getting into it too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh you know, I, I like to think of, you know, the medieval times when um, all, a lot of women were making beer. A lot of women are getting into it now too. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So if anyone wants to chat about homebrew, drop me a line. I definitely would go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, we, <laughs> even, um, we even have a member, uh, Wild East 
brewing company because they set up labs, right, for their brewing. So they use our yep. discounts with VWR. So, Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's so it's, there's a lot of transferable knowledge and I have learned that um, a lot of people that get into this are from the pharma industry. Yeah. Just <laughs> from, all, yeah. Into all the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know, but the skill set, you know, it is so transferable and it's like slow motion baking. It's so much fun. So much fun. I do find it. I do find it slightly like right with the universe though, that it is much easier to make Budweiser than it is to make like a cell therapy for, for curing cancer. I wish it was the other way around. I wish we could just <laughs> turn all of our assets from, you know, the light beer industry into, you know, into better cell therapies to cure cancer. But it seems justifiably right that the, uh, that the latter is a harder problem than the former. Yeah. We like hard problems. It's, I, I mean, yes. I, it's nice to be, you know, chipping away at something and know that I can chip away at that for, you know, let's say we live to be 120. Like, I, I feel like I could still be working on this, you know, in yeah. whatever iteration that is yeah. in, in that time, you know, it's, it's really nice to be in an industry where, you know, you're not going to exhaust yourself of difficult problems ever. Yeah. So you have to take care of yourself because chances are you're in a, a string of ultra marathons that's going to last decades. Yeah, we, uh, we actually have a few. Um, we have a few audience questions that I, I don't want to skip. So we'll do a little bit of a lightning round with some um, yes. thoughts okay. from the audience. Um, um, one um, audience member asked if your preclinical studies were done in house or if you contracted them out. We did contract them out. Um, sometimes to academic institutions, other times to CROs. Yep. And then one of your investors actually asked a question. If you can share a little bit about how your discussion um, discussions are going with Hackensack Health and any licensing opportunities, including the um, Hospital for Special Surgery. We love, so I don't, um, all right, I'll have to figure out who, who that is. Who asked, Daniel but, Martinez. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> so, um, you know, we were very lucky. I, I didn't talk a lot about um, our investors, but... Um, you know, the journey that we've made from angel to venture capital and, and so on. Um, recruiting strategic investment has been a really important thing for us. So whether in our early stages, it was recruiting, um, you know, friends and family and angel investors who had industry ties mm -hmm. to literally going after professional athletes and other high performers in the, you know, going after the Department of Defense and so on. Getting Hackensack Meridian, which is New Jersey's largest provider um, to invest directly in the company has been really good for us because those are our future end users. Yeah. Um, and Hackensack cares a lot about regenerative medicine. So I can't speak to specific projects, um, but I will say that they are very collaborative and excited about working with some of their portfolio companies um, to uh, generate therapies collaboratively. And um, we hope to be part of that story. They're wonderful people. And, um, you know, HSS is, um, is our, in our home turf and we've had wonderful discussions with them as well. And um, we, we don't have, you know, uh, Scott Rodeo has helped us with a couple of, um, one of the surgeons there has helped us with some of our grants and, and we're hoping to be able to work with them too. They are, you know, ha hands down, you know, in terms of the number of the volume and the vertical integration that they have, they are like a small country and we're so happy to have them, you know, in our backyard and um, we'd love to collaborate with them, especially now as we're getting more mature. I think, um, you know, we weren't at a place where it was a natural fit earlier on, but we're getting into that sweet spot now where I'm hoping we can collaborate with more, with more hospitals. So we had another one which is asking if there's any development on regenerating the cortical bone. Well, you know, it's hard to really define the exact type of bone that we grow. It's um, maybe, you know, we're using, um, well, we're, it's almost like spongy bone as our initial scaffold. And then it kind of mm -hmm. turns into more like flat bone by the time we're done with it. Um, for us, you know, because I guess for us, the current clinical gold standard is autograft. Um, so cutting bone out of one part of your body and moving it to another. And oftentimes yep. that bone is cut from the iliac crest um, and is put in other parts of the body. So we're not as concerned about whether or not we're matching the exact microarchitecture of a particular mm -hmm. you know, piece of anatomy, um, but rather the, the kind of gross um, 
the bulk properties, I would say, of the tissue matching what you would get if you say you were to harvest a piece of iliac crest. Um, so we haven't really focused a ton of attention on, um, you know, are we tweaking this bone to be more like, you know, what you would find in the ribs or versus the, the cranium. Um, the, the bone that we have is passes muster from a biomechanical point of view and, and can really uh, integrate with any other bone anyway. So we haven't focused a ton of attention there, but we have had to prove to the FDA with a very stringent tests, um, a lot of the biomechanics of what we engineer. Yeah. And like you said before, it's one of the things where in, in picking your applications, you have to be pretty careful of what kind of things you're going to do in terms of clinical development, et cetera. It's kind of a more, you know, fully comprehensive thing about, okay, what is the entire indication we're thinking of what does the clinical path look like to demonstrate it and how are we then going to do it i imagine it's a much more difficult uh set of decision making than than scientifically could you do it because right. just from a platform perspective i would assume the scientifically could you do it question you could answer that pretty well but there's a whole bunch of other you know things that complicate those decisions yeah yeah, well yeah. Said. and along those lines yeah. we just had a question um an exclusionary question so are patients with prior irradiation to the reconstructive site excluded from the planned clinical trial? Well, we certainly can't have anyone with active um, malignancies. Um, whether or not prior radiation, um, I, I don't know if I can really comment on that because I, I, I don't remember if there were certain time limitations, for example. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, so sorry, I just, I can't answer that one off the top of my head, but certainly um, in our first trial, we're excluding folks with, um, with malignancies. Benign tumors, we will consider. Okay. So this question we get every week, uh, do the mammalian cells you use need to be in natural buoyancy fluid to grow well? We grow our, well, we have adherent cells. Um, so we grow them in cell culture media, um, in, in tissue culture flasks before we seed them into our scaffold. So our cells are always adherent, whether it's to the bottom of the, the, the flask or um, in three dimensions on the scaffold. So they're never floating around. Nope. Okay. They're never free. Well, Not like in homebrew. They're, no, they're never free. Yes. Nope. In homebrew, we've got the lots difference. of cells floating around. We can we can retitle this one beer versus bone when we when we get down to it. So we beer have is a, good we for have bone a, health, by the way. Yes. It has I, been pointed I out. I find to that me. beer is good for so many things. Um, Especially good oatmeal. Beer is stout. good for. Beer seems to be good for just about just a lot of health, you know, except outside the liver. Um, so we we have a few minutes left, and you know. I'd like, as, as a bit of a parting shot, where, where do you want EpiBone to be in the next kind of three or four years? How do you see you guys managing the transition from uh, clinical trials to starting to build out a commercial infrastructure? And, you know, really the thing that we would love to see is, you know, we want to see this getting to as many patients as possible. Yeah, I think you put it well. I, in the next three to four years, we won't be um, at the commercial stage in human, I don't expect, unless mm -hmm. there's a big shift from a regulatory perspective, but we will have made quite a bit of progress clinically and we should be getting our, um, you know, our, our rolling up our sleeves from a um, commercial rollout perspective. We should be working on definitely having answers to those questions of outsource versus make in-house. We're working on those now actually as part of our, our next fundraise, those plans. And, um, and I would also like to see us, you know, digging deep and, and, and proving ourselves with our clinical trial and, and bone, um, but also starting to build out more of our platform. Uh, I think it would be nice to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm not a, 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 an early stage CEO with bright, shiny object syndrome, you know, constantly falling in love with every possibility. Um, however, you know, I would like to apply some of our success, success that we've gotten and you, you know, undeniably by that point um, and apply that to, um, to other big problems. You know, I love this field. I am enchanted with biology. I am enchanted with the um, the beauty of the bodies we live in, and uh, the idea that by the time we go through this lifetime, seventy five percent of us are going to be living with parts of our bodies that we were not born with, if we aren't already, uh, is just to me something I would like to help our society avoid. I would like for us to not replace parts of our bodies with metal and plastic, but our own cells. And um, I don't see myself getting bored 
of that question in the next three to four years. I think um, if I'm doing my job well now and really stick at, you know, stick at it, keep doing it every day, showing up for that marathon, I think that in three or four years time, um, we will be ready to um, apply our learnings in service of, of, of more problems. And I, I think that will be exciting for me. It's, it's never a dull moment, but I think that's what yeah. I'd like to build towards is, you know, being able to give back to other earlier stage companies, um, maybe even getting active in investing on my person, you know, in my personal life um, and, and, and leveraging whatever success we would have had at that point with our lead product towards building out more. It's a big problem. Well, well you, have yes, big, you have big solutions in mind. And so we appreciate that. Um, and we appreciate your joining us today. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you to Goodwin for sponsoring. And Nina, you have been an amazing guest. So thank, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your insight, and your plans with us. Thank you. And, and thanks to Goodwin for also being an important support for EpiBone as well. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Thanks and so much. Me. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Bye, You're everyone. Great thank great you. Day. All right. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.